My name is Joel Haas. I'm the current president of the Association for Mathematical Research. And I'd like to welcome everyone to this first lecture in the AMR lecture series on recent mathematical advances. The AMR RMA lectures will cover interesting developments in all of mathematics. The scientific committee for the AMR RMA lectures consists of Anna Felixson, Daniel Peralta Salas, Josef Polterowicz, and Leonid Polterowicz. These lectures are sponsored by the Association for Mathematical Research, whose mission is to support mathematical research and scholarship. If you're not yet a member, please join. Membership is free. Today's speaker will be introduced by Daniel Peralta Salas. Okay, so good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. So on behalf of the scientific committee, it's a pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Svetlana Jitomirskaya as the first speaker of this distinguished lecture series of the AMR. So Lana is distinguished professor of mathematics at the University of California, Irvine, and Howard Chair Professor at Georgia Tech. Her research lines involve uh, the spectral theory of almost periodic Schrodinger operators and related problems in mathematical physics and dynamical systems. Her main distinctions include a plenary lecture at the ICM last year, the Sutter Prize in Mathematics in 2005, the Heinemann Prize for Mathematical Physics in 2020, and the Ladisenskaya Prize in Mathematical Physics in 2022. But more important than awards and honors are her mathematical contributions, which are really deep and influential. We can mention her solution, joined with Arturo Villa to the 10 Martini problem, her proof of the existence of the metal insulator transition for the almost mathy operator, or the first general result on the continuity of the Lyapunov exponents in joint work with Jan Bulgan. Today, she's going to talk about uh, multiplicative Jensen's formula, dual Lyapunov exponents, and global theory of one-dimensional analytic quasi-periodic operators. So, Lana, thanks a lot for accepting our invitation. It's your time, so when you want, you can start. Thank you very much for this very kind introduction, and uh, thank you very much for inviting me, for organizing this series, first of all. I think it will be a very exciting series by the... AMR, and I really like that it's a palindromic series, RMA AMR, and uh, thank you for giving me an opportunity to present here. Uh, if uh, you've listened, uh, happened to listen to my uh, ICM talk last year, uh, the first part will be kind of similar, but then it will uh, depart, and uh, there will be some new exciting stuff. So one can view at least a part of my SM talk as a rehearsal for this one. So I am really glad to have this additional opportunity to present this really cool recent research. Uh, it, okay, so let me start with the physics origin of the problem. I uh, will be discussing, and um, we will start with uh, discrete two-dimensional Laplacian. So it is just an operator on L2 of Z2 that <coughs> takes uh, that just um, takes psi into the sum of over its nearest neighbors. It can be viewed, uh, it can be thought of a discretization of the Laplacian and you don't need the minus in the discrete case because everything is bounded. But um, actually this is a model that appears in physics as a completely, not as a discretization, but in its own right. It's a so-called tight binding model of an electron in a two dimensional crystal. And then if you look at the spectrum of this operator, we know that it is minus four, four. So since it is a lecture, not just for the analysts, I prepared a little tutorial on what the spectrum is, but maybe I can skip it. What do you think? Okay, I'll just go very fast. Yes, okay, so 
the spectrum of an operator, it's a familiar object from linear algebra. It's uh, just uh, for a matrix, uh, it's a set of eigenvalues, uh, but set of eigenvalues can be described in different ways. And it turns out that only one way actually generalizes well to the infinite dimensional setting. And that is the set of energy such that H minus E does not have a bounded inverse. And in infinite dimensional setting, it of course contains eigenvalues because then H minus, uh, well, uh, for eigenvalues, H minus E is not injective, right? But it also contains some other stuff in principle. A prime example is if you consider uh, your uh, Hilbert space as L2 of some measure space and take an operator multiplication by a function. HF takes L2 into multiplication by, let's say, bounded function. And then <laughs> there are not too many options for what H minus E is, right? If it exists, it is just multiplication by one over F minus E. And therefore, the, uh, the spectrum is E such that multiplication by one over F minus E is not a bounded operator. And it's not difficult to see that it's precisely the so-called essential range of the function F. That is uh, the set of E such that F takes the value in uh, interval E minus epsilon, E plus epsilon uh, for an epsilon on a set of positive members. And it is also not difficult to see that spectrum is a unitary invariant. And actually, this example is important because spectral theorem, one of its formulations, basically says that every self-adjoint uh, operator on a Hilbert space is unitarily equivalent to multiplication by F uh, or, uh, in some in a certain setting like that. So, um, and uh, therefore, if we go back to our discrete two-dimensional Laplacian, again, it's very easy to see that by just taking Fourier transform in both variables, it's unitarily equivalent to multiplication by two cosine X plus two cosine Y on L2 of the two-dimensional torus. And therefore, the spectrum is the essential range of the function 2 cosine x plus 2 cosine y, which is just minus 4 four. OK, so now let us modify this operator a little bit, namely by adding a magnetic field orthogon with flux orthogonal, uniform flux orthogonal to the our two-dimensional plane. And what does it mean? Basically, we need to choose a gauge field, uh, choose uh, such assignments for the ages, the MN, BMN, such that when we go around each cell, we accumulate to pi alpha. And then we incorporate them like that in the operator. So, and I showed incorporation of one particular gauge that is called standard Landau gauge. It's analog of the gauge that is used to to diagonalize the harmonic oscillator. Um, so if you just uh, assign weights to vertical lines. And then uh, this is one possible representation of operator in the magnetic. Okay, so that's what it becomes. And then uh, basically what we get is the so-called tight binding model of two-dimensional block electron in magnetic fields. So this is, again, it's one of its equivalent representations. Now, if alpha is equal to zero, as we just discussed, the spectrum is, we just have a discrete Laplacian, so the spectrum is the interval minus four. And what if, what is the spectrum if alpha is positive. And here is the answer. So this picture shows the plot of the spectrum <coughs> for uh, such operators um, for different values of alpha. So uh, let me explain. Alpha is um, here plotted on the vertical axis and then on the horizontal axis you have the spectra. 
So if alpha is zero, the spectrum is minus four, four. Actually, this picture is created only for rational values of alpha. If alpha is one half, here is the spectrum, it's two touching intervals. Uh, if alpha is one third, the spectrum consists of these three intervals and so forth. So you see that they organize themselves into this very beautiful self-similar structure where the entire picture repeats itself in a distorted way in each of these cells and uh, ad infinitum. And uh, this is so-called Hofstadter butterfly, a numerically produced plot of such spectra. And uh, let me say, say a few words about the history. So this model, actually the way I write it down, Precisely this model was first introduced by Pyrrhus in 1933. And then Pyrrhus moved to some other projects. He was actually quite active in the Manhattan Project. And then after the war, he decided to look again at, more, at, importance, at the important stuff and gave this problem to his PhD student, Harper, to study. And Harper published a paper in 1955 on this that actually did not go very far beyond Pyrrhus' paper in 1933. But as a result, this is called the Harper's model. And uh, actually, one can also introduce an additional parameter lambda here, which would correspond to an isotropy of the lattice. This can be done. And Herbert's model became extremely popular in physics. Look how many results. 383 million. <laughs> well. Of course, uh, these are not necessarily all related to <laughs> this Harper model, right? But even if you say Harper model physics, you still have uh, lots of results. Again, not, not all of them will be related, but um, even without, uh, even if you reduce further, you still have tens of thousands of hits here. And uh, it actually became so popular after uh, Douglas Kofstadter, who was a PhD student at the time, plotted this picture. It was in 1976. It was probably the very first numerically produced beautiful fractal, even before the word fractal was coined by Mandelbrot. And it was something completely unexpected by physicists who looked into this. Uh, his PhD advisor, Greg Van Year, was actually against him studying this stuff. He said that it's, uh, when he first proposed that there might be something like that, and uh, it, you can maybe see this is a structure related to continuous fraction expansion of the flux alpha. And uh, when he originally said that this is numerology, not physics, this is not something that uh, can happen. But when he saw this picture, he changed his mind. And David Jennings described it as a picture of God. And Hofstadter uh, later wrote in his book that you may have seen that he thinks this description is not blasphemous at all. So uh, this is a book written by physicists. There are lots of other exciting uh, features of this butterfly. You see Apollonian circles here, for example, and uh, lots of other cool stuff. But uh, so <laughs> still uh, the actual reason why physicists are so excited about it is uh, that uh, it's not simply a theoretical thing. So Hofstadter wrote in 1980 that he would be the most surprised person in the world if it came out in any experiment, in any non-numerical real experiment. And in the same year, 1980, integer quantum Hall effect was uh, discovered by von Klitzing. And uh, Taulis, <laughs> I actually explain the quantization of charge transport and this effect uh, 
using this model, it's central to the theory. And uh, so I'll just show one more, a couple more pretty picture before I move to mass. So this is an illustration of quantum hole effect, uh, gaps in the this butterfly color, uh, color, uh, color, this color code according to Chern, Chern numbers, positive correspond to warm colors and negative to cold colors produced by Yossi Avron and his student Osachi. So this has become also popular. So people uh, see this uh, experiment butterflies experimentally in the studies of graphene. Yeah, yeah. You also see these butterflies. So they're kind of physicists like. Them. Okay, let's move to mass. No more pictures. Sorry. So um, what was uh, mathematicians actually got excited uh, soon after Hofstadter, uh, but basically from the early 80s. And um, the star here is, so let's look at uh, this um, um, anisotropic um, Harper's model. And this is basically already what um, Pyrrhus did in his work in 1933, because you see it is periodic in one variable. So you basically uh, can do block like expansion in one variable and essentially Fourier transform in one variable. And then it effectively reduces to a direct integral in the phase data of such one-dimensional operators. So the spectrum of these two-dimensional guy is equal to the union of the spectra of these guys in data. But the nice thing about these guys, and I'll say it, uh, it again in, on one of the next slides is that if alpha is a, an irrational number, this is a so-called so ergodic operator and spectrum actually does not depend on it. So spectra of this guy and this guy coincide. Now, this is a so-called almost meteor operator. Its name was coined by Barry Simon, along with many, many other names in this field and basically, it has become quite popular in mathematics, largely, I'd say, due to Barry Simon, because he kept popularizing it. Uh, first, uh, he had this famous uh, paper, 15 Problems in Mathematical Physics, published in 1985. So there were 15 problems, like shows that crystals exist and stuff. So like 15 problems he deemed important. And three of those were about uh, this operator. And I, I can't really explain why. And then he doubled down on it in uh, his paper, Mathematical Physics in the 21st Century. And again, uh, there, there has already been a lot of progress and some of his problems were proved, dis disproved, some were proved for almost all parameters and still he listed three almost major problems there. So of course, it was extremely tempting for people to solve those. This list of problems are really uh, uh, good for developing good mass and uh, is that it's my understanding that one of the MRs activities will be maintaining full list of problems and uh, so okay but here this is a, of course as mathematicians uh, this is just the cosine so of course it's tempting to replace it by another function f in place of the cosine and see how things work then. And uh, so, oops, sorry. This plus should be an equal sign. Sorry about that. So, and this places us into actually more general theory of so-called ergodic Schrodinger operators. So we can actually consider something even more general. We consider them on L2 of ZD. Again, of course, there are continual analogs, but actually discrete operators 
are the ones originally coming from physics in this business. And uh, kind of the theory has been developing faster and in a more interesting way in the discrete setting, I would say. So again, this plus is an equal sign. So it is just uh, a discrete Laplacian or your other favorite elliptic operator plus potential, where the potential is given by the values of the function along some ergodic action of the D. And uh, then, as I already mentioned, basically by ergodicity, and this goes, uh, these operators were first studied in the 70s, uh, the first uh, person who worked on those, those, I think it was Leonid Pasteur. And, uh, but uh, actually it sped up significantly in the early 80s. And already at the beginning of the theory, it was shown that the, the spectrum then, and it is an easy corollary of ergodicity, does not depend, and also spectral components like absolutely continuous spectrum, singular continuous spectrum, and point spectrum are the same for almost every data whenever this T is ergodic. And uh, note that by pure point spectrum or singular continuous spectrum, uh, we mean uh, here closures uh, of corresponding uh, collection of eigenvalues or support of singular continuous measure. Uh, so uh, the, the eigenvalues themselves actually will depend sensitively. And prominent, very prominent examples in this theory are the Anderson model, where VNs are IDRVs, and there are still uh, uh, the one dimensional theory is very well developed, but there are still very important problems in multi dimensional setting. And quasi periodic operators, where uh, the probability space is uh, the torus, and ergodic action is just an ergodic rotation. But uh, quasi-periodic operators also, of course, once you study them, it is also natural to look at the corresponding periodic operators when omega is rational. Uh, now, uh, for quasi-periodic operators, and again, they are the star of my talk, and more specifically, one-dimensional ones are the star of my talk. I'm just mentioning this. Uh, um, uh, so the spectrum and uh, both the spectrum and absolutely continuous spectrum are actually the same for all phases. And uh, quasi-periodic operators have very... Uh, turned out to be very appealing mathematically because they have very exotic, it was noticed early on that they have very exotic spectral properties, something that you don't really find in other systems. So, uh, and uh, let me now go back to the one dimensional setting and uh, I need to introduce a couple of concepts. So bear with me. And uh, whenever you have a one-dimensional operator, actually it need not be quasi-periodic. It could be just any ergodic operator, any dynamically defined operator. You can uh, think of it in terms of dynamical systems and in terms of Schrodinger cost cycles. And what this is, it is the following. So if you look at the eigenvalue equation, if you just try to solve this equation, it's a second difference equation. And you can reconstruct psi n plus one psi n from psi n, psi n minus one by the action of this transfer matrix. So it's just the rewriting of this equation. And then of course you can uh, take application of n of those. And then uh, that's how you reconstruct n psi n minus one from the initial values. So, and here you see uh, the cost cycle of rotation, a product of uh, matrices uh, like that. So generally we have a, uh, we call it quasi periodic cost cycle. It's a map from the one dimensional uh, it's one dimensional quasi periodic cycle from a map of the torus times C2. Uh, 
into itself where phase goes into theta plus alpha and uh, uh, V goes into A, A of theta B. And the particular form of Schrodinger cycles, uh, so they need not have this form, but if they have this, such a form, that's what appeared in this transfer matrices that I just showed, they're called Schrodinger cycles. Now, in general, whenever you have a cycle, actually, a more general cycle in any such line, linear cycle over some dynamics, uh, Lebonov exponent is a well-defined object. Just you take the limit of one over n, integral of the log of the norm of the nth iteration of this guy. And this exists uh, simply because uh, this, this quantity log of the norm uh, of a n plus m is bounded by the uh, by the log of the norm of a uh, integral of the log of a n is bounded by integral of the log of a n plus integral of the log of a m. So, and this is just an easy exercise that such a limit exists and equal to the infimum of this quantity. So, um, in actually, in case of d-dimensional cycles, so if you have, if you take uh, CD and the matrix, I say, say in SP uh, of uh, say symplectic mat matrix, then uh, one can define uh, uh, correspondingly many Lapunov exponents just by taking integral of the singular values. So, and this will play a role. How is it related to the spectrum? So, uh, the relation is the following. Uh, there is a so-called Johnson theorem that says that E is not in the spectrum of H if and only if uh, the corresponding cycle is a uniformly hyperbolic dynamical system. So uh, this is a well-defined notion in dynamical systems, but it is not something that you can see just from the Lyapunov exponent alone. It does uh, require Lyapunov exp to be not in the spectrum. It requires positivity of the Lyapunov exponent, but you can still be in the spectrum even with positive Lyapunov exponent. So if he is in the spectrum uh, and Lyapunov exponent is positive, therefore by Johnson theorem, you have to you have that this cycle is non-uniformly hyperbolic. So basically the spectrum is a bifurcation set for this cycle. Okay. Now, okay, again, there is this is a little tech problem, but uh, there is a beautiful Cotani theory that completely describes absolutely continuous spectrum in terms of the Lapunov exponent. Namely, it's so this bar should be over the whole thing, sorry. Namely, absolutely continuous spectrum is the essential closure of the set of E such that Lapunov exponent is zero. So just looking at the Lapunov exponent, you can completely describe uh, absolutely continuous spectrum. You cannot, uh, in general, for uh, the spectrum itself. You can also not, even if you know that Lapunov exponent in the spectrum is positive, you generally cannot say anything about whether, for example, your uh, all you know by Cotani theory is that there is no absolutely continuous spectrum, but you cannot distinguish between pure point and singular continuous spectrum uh, because um, in principle, if you look at, uh, you can imagine uh, there is a selected theorem that says that not only the, so well, there is Kingman theorem that says not only the limit of these integrals is the Lapunov exponent, but also almost everywhere limit is the Lapunov exponent, and also for almost every x. And also, 
There is a selected theorem that basically says that for every E, for almost every X, every solution is a, a, a decays exponentially if the Laponov exponent is positive at the Laponov rate or grows exponentially at the Laponov rate. And it's very tempting to conclude from that that if Laponov exponent is positive, then the spectrum, that, then you can only have exponentially decaying eigenvalues because it, it, it applies to both sides. So if um, your solution cannot grow exponential and this, this is not allowed by some general uh, facts like Schnell theorem, then it has to decay exponentially in both sides. However, the problem here is with kind of is a Fubini argument because for every E it happens for almost every X and it could potentially happen that for some X, um, therefore for almost every X it happens for almost every E and it could happen that for some X spectral measure is supported precisely on the measure zero set that is bad for this oscillated theorem. And <laughs> It was realized early on that it actually does happen, and even in this almost matter operator, if alphas are very well approximated by the rationals, if they are so called Liouville numbers. And, uh, but anyway, uh, basically, Schrodinger co cycles are an interesting dynamical system to study because the simplest classes of uh, that compatible with both KM and non uniform hyperbolicity. But as far as spectral theory goes, kind of traditionally, people, once people realize that. Uh, uh, from positivity of Laponov exponents, you cannot actually conclude. Uh, uh, that uh, you have so-called pure point spectrum, they uh, stopped looking into this in this direction for a while. But uh, one nice uh, property uh, of this uh, um, quasi-periodic models is that actually they are almost unique in uh, the fact that they feature this metal insulator transition when you change parameters. And for the almost meteor operator, uh, it was realized early on that there is a transition at lambda equal to one. Lambda is this anisotropy parameter, so lambda equal to one corresponds to the isotropic two-dimensional lattice. And uh, so basically for uh, couplings less than one that related to subcritical, you have metal-like behavior reducibility and you can apply reducibility methods to study. And for lambda bigger than one, you have insulator-like behavior, point spectrum and so forth. And uh, I am almost done with introducing concept. One more important concept is uh, comes uh, from complexification of analytic cycles. cycles And uh, this probably, the idea goes back to the work of Michel Hermann, who first used it to show precisely this uh, uh, major uh, positivity of Laponov exponent for lambda bigger than one for the almost meta operator. But generally, if you have analytic, uh, your analytic potential or more generally analytic per cycle, uh, it turns out that it is extremely fruitful to study the behavior of the Laponov exponent as a function of epsilon. And that's what Artur Avila did in his global theory paper. And uh, if you look at uh, look at it, you immediately see that as a function of epsilon, it's a function that is constant in the imaginary part of epsilon because imaginary part of epsilon turns back into x. And so, uh, by Adamar's three circle theorem, you immediately get convexity, and therefore this limit is well defined. I will call it acceleration. 
And then he proposed to divide the spectrum into this oops, three regimes, a kind of model by the almost matter operator, the subcritical regime, where Lyapunov exponent is equal to zero and acceleration is zero. The critical regime, where Lyapunov exponent is equal to zero and acceleration is positive, and I will show that generically it doesn't exist, but that's what we have for the almost method, the critical value. Uh, and supercritical regime, where Lyapunov exponent is uh, positive and acceleration is positive. Okay. And uh, so one remarkable fact that uh, he discovered there is that the acceleration is quantized. Namely, uh, this uh, quantity, so you can see the 2 pi here, is an integer number. So it is a symmetric function, so it's automatic, so it behaves kind of like that. What has been unclear was that, so you have this points where transition happens and you have these integers, integer slopes. And uh, so actually the fact that acceleration is an integer in the uniformly hyperbolic regime is essentially trivial. So what was uh, remarkable is that it is, it is also an integer in the non-uniformly hyperbolic regime. Uh, because in the uniformly hyperbolic regime, uh, the, uh, the co-cycle reduces to just multiplication by uh, hyperbolic matrix. So it reduces to a multiplication by a diagonal matrix where uh, one entry in the diagonal is uniformly larger than one. So this... Uh, K becomes basically the winding number for this uh, function. So, and then uh, he used the continuity of the Lapunov exponents and uh, approximation by polynomials to uh, show that it is also the same uh, actually on the spectrum. But still, it uh, kind of uh, remains unclear what are the turning points and what are the integer slopes, and it is something that I will answer today. Uh, but uh, before doing that, let me just say that, uh, as I mentioned, prompted by maybe Barry Simon's problems or uh, interest from physics, many, many results uh, very, very delicate results have been obtained specifically for this almost mature period. And uh, I will list them now. I will go through them quickly. But um, uh, what I am getting at is, is that uh, it is actually quite desirable to try to get this result for more general uh, analytic functions, right? And because if some result does not withhold any perturbation, and uh, then it's kind of strange. So it, it is. It should be expected that if you take some cosine type function, some some neighborhood of this almost matter operator, that results are similar. However, many results have exploited dramatically the intrinsic symmetries of this model and has been proved in the very specific way. So uh, one, for example, is this arithmetic result. So uh, basically, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the tradition uh, after it was realized that positive Lyapunov exponent does not lead to uh, so-called localization, pure point spectrum with exponentially decaying eigenfunctions, people have tried to prove it by KM methods and by some complicated scheme. And uh, uh, so, in 99, I realized that actually one can explore positivity of Lyapunov exponent, and I did this for this almost major operator. 
and uh, developed a rather simple method to do it, uh, which led to pure point spectrum for arithmetically defined uh, alpha and theta. And then uh, uh, Borgen and Goldstein uh, uh, basically obtained uh, this result, uh, pure point spectrum for positive Lyapunov exponent, but uh, for for almost every set of alpha data for general analytic potentials, and uh, that uh, uh, later on, Burgen with collaborators, uh, and uh, more recently, uh, extended. Uh, uh, developed this into a very powerful method to actually study multidimensional systems where there are no Lapunov exponents, even basically proving localization based on uh, estimates of green, uh, green, green function estimates and uh, large deviations for them. But uh, uh, what all this work, and this is a large body of work, this is a 2005 book by Burgen, where uh, this, uh, what has been done before then is described, but there is, there is a lot of recent activity. But all these results for general analytic function and extension are not arithmetic. So they kind of depart, they kind of... Uh, originally uh, used uh, this positivity of Lapunov exponent and uh, this analysis, but um, when talking about general analytics, they lose arithmetic control. Why is arithmetic control important? Well, uh, one reason is the, just one second, the 10 martini problem, because uh, it turned out that it was, uh, so the 10 martini problem is that the spectrum is a counter set for all irrational alpha. And uh, this uh, uh, was originally solved for almost all alpha, basically by, by Joachim Puge, based on uh, your point spectrum for very specific phase, phase equal to zero, uh, that was proved in my 99 book. And later we solved it for all remaining, for, for all irrational alpha. So, but this requires kind of very delicate uh, analysis uh, and required very specific uh, arithmetic results. And uh, and this is uh, actually a statement that is of interest in physics. So apparently, uh, there is still partially outstanding Dryden Martini problem, and uh, showing it for all alpha is kind of equivalent to the statement that the butterfly has wings, which is visually obvious. But uh, so those things are actually important. And uh, so now. Some further arithmetic results. So uh, we have obtained uh, sharp arithmetic, uh, z z z what one knows for specifically for the almost major operator, sharp arithmetic transition between point and singular continuous spectrum. You can precisely describe the arithmetics of when you're singular continuous, of alpha when you're singular continuous and or of your point or of the phase. Uh, very recent work by Wen Sai Lu for, for completely who solved uh, the question we posed with Avila for completely resonant phases. For general analytic, all this is specific for the almost matter. For general analytic, there are no results. Then again with Wen Sai Lu, we discovered that there is a universal hierarchical structure of all eigenfunctions related to continued fraction expansion of the flux. Again, specifically for the almost matter operator for general analytic, there has been nothing. The 10 martini problem, there is a result for general analytic, but by Goldstein and Schlag, but again, it's no, it's not arithmetic in alpha. It, it cannot pinpoint a single alpha where it holds and it requires positivity of the Lapunov exponent. 
And uh, also a similar situation with the problem about absolute continuity of the integrated density of states. So, uh, and now I am ready to introduce the recent results. And basically it has been uh, a long project. Uh, uh, so it is uh, work in progress where we uh, try to expand uh, to extend all these results at least to the neighborhood of the almost meteor operator and in general potentially ambitiously to uh, general uh, quasi-periodic operators. So all these uh, ha have been long considered kind of big problems because again all these proofs used the specific of almost major very, very much. So for example, for the 10 Martini problem, basically uh, we wrote a short companion paper with Avila called Solving the 10 Martini problem. And there we write that basically there are two different approaches uh, from the Diofantine side and Liouville side. Actually, it was sold originally for very little number in a remarkable paper by Choi, Elliot, and Yui uh, by very algebraic methods, okay, based on the properties of, uh, of uh, I Gaussian integers, right? And um, so... Uh, we, we wrote that it is uh, really remarkable that these two approaches kind of meet in the middle, that it is kind of almost a miracle. We felt very lucky that uh, the two approaches, two completely different approaches met in the middle. And it was very, especially the algebraic part by Choi, Elon, and Yui was very, very almost major specific. And so this is a long-term project with Ling Rui Ge and also uh, Zhang Gong Yu and Chi Zhu and uh, Xin Zhao in various collaborations where we are looking at extending the specific almost meteor results that so far has not been, has uh, resisted general treatment to uh, general case. And for this purpose, we introduce operators of type one. And uh, we introduce, so remember acceleration was uh, the derivative of Lyapunov exponent in epsilon at zero. And, okay, uh, this zero should be epsilon one, I'm sorry. So, we, the, Define generalized acceleration as the derivative of Lyapunov exponent at its first turning point. So basically, uh, if uh, the so generalized ex, uh, ex, and we de define operators of type one as operators whose generalized acceleration is equal to one everywhere on the spectrum. So basically it includes operators whose uh, acceleration is equal to one on some part of the spectrum and zero on some other part of the spectrum as long as after the first turning point, the acceleration is equal to one. So why is it a nice definition? Because it is stable, it's an open condition. So when you perturb your operator, your potential, this, uh, if you have generalized ac acceleration equal to one on the spectrum, it stays one on the spectrum. It's not true for the for original Havilah's notion of acceleration, it's not stable. So, for example, you, if you can perturb critical almost meta operator to become subcritical, and then acceleration was one on the spectrum and it becomes zero. And this one is stable, it's not very difficult to see. So, in particular, uh, for the almost meta operator, generalized acceleration is always equal to one. 
and in, therefore it's also equal to one in its neighborhood, in its analytic neighborhood. And so let me introduce some recent results. So for that, uh, I introduce uh, this uh, notion, uh, measure or certain measure of irrationality of alpha, beta of alpha, which is uh, uh, this quantity. Uh, basically, it's the exponential rate of approximation of alpha by the rationals. And uh, so for diophantine, for almost every alpha, this beta is equal to zero. But in principle, it can be equal to any number and it can be equal to infinity. Uh, so, uh, and uh, the sharp arithmetic transitions that I mentioned were in terms of this beta of alpha and uh, we will see soon how they work. So uh, one theorem, uh, it's already a preprint from last year, that for uh, almost every alpha, in, namely for when beta of alpha is zero, the integrated density of states is absolutely continuous for non uh, for uh, operators of type one that are non-critical. We expect this condition not to be needed actually, but uh, so uh, this is so so far that's what we have. And now. Second result in terms of the 10 Martini problem, we can extend it to all operators of type one defined by an even trigonometric polynomial. So again, we expect both even condition and trigonometric polynomial condition. Actually, we already sort of know how to remove them, but this requires a lot more work. So this is what has already been done. But what is remarkable here is that we have no condition on alpha, just like in the 10 Martini uh, problem. And uh, where in particular for the Leoville case, uh, the solution of the original 10 Martini problem was just purely algebraic and uh, very, very uh, almost Matthew specific dependent. Uh, in fact, it uh, follows from the following theorem that uh, whenever uh, the set where uh, this generalized acceleration is equal to one is always a counter set. And uh, finally, we do have uh, this uh, sharp arithmetic transition uh, result. Uh, so pure point spectrum uh, for Laponov exponent when Laponov exponent is bigger than beta and singular continuous spectrum when Laponov exponent is less than beta for all uh, operators of type one. So, uh, and um, to describe how we arrived to that and what underlies this very recent development, I come to the second part of my talk, which is actually equally exciting to me in its own right. And uh, this is um, uh, about Jensen's formula that was in the title. So uh, if you, uh, here is a, is a classical Jensen's formula. If you look at the logarithmic integral over the circle of a radius e to the epsilon. So um, that's our complex parameter epsilon. You can rewrite the classical Jensen's formula in the following way. All right, so it is the sum, uh, the same integral where over the circle of radius one minus the sum of the logs of the positions of uh, uh, zeros. Uh, uh, okay, AIs are the eyes. Uh, sorry about that. And uh, so basically, if you plot it in epsilon, this is the picture you have. This is the picture. Mm -hmm. Jensen's formula, the behavior of this logarithmic integral is a function of epsilon. 
And so you see that uh, this kind of resembles a picture we already saw today. This is a picture of from Avila's global theory. And of course, it's not an accident because if you take the one-dimensional co-cycle, then uh, this is precisely, this logarithmic integral is precisely its Lyapunov exponent. So Jensen's formula can be viewed as a formula for the Lyapunov, for the behavior in the imaginary part of the Lyapunov exponent of one-dimensional cycles. So uh, uh, Avila's quantization of acceleration state is basically the statement that for two-dimensional Schrodinger cycles, you also have such behavior. But why and what is the role of these zeros? And so here comes uh, our answer. And this is joint work with Ling Rugge, Zhang Yu, and Chi Zhu. And that for Schrodinger cross cycles, we have the complete analog of Jensen's formula. This is classical Jensen's formula. So A i is again a zeros of the function f. And here we have we replace logarithms of AIs by so-called Li hats, which are the objects we call dual Lapunov exponents. So Basically, this dual Lyapunov of exponents, they play the role of zeros of analytic functions for Schrodinger cosines. And uh, what are the dual Lyapunov of exponents? So I need to say a word about the Aubrey duality. So remember, we started with this two-dimensional operator in a magnetic field, and I said that there is an arbitrariness in the choice of the gauge. And in particular, we can rotate the gauge by pi over two and nothing will change. It will be the same operator. And this is in some sense what the Aubrey duality is. So it's basically, it comes from this um, turning of the gauge by pi over two and it's a Fourier type transform. It can be viewed as a unitary map from uh, such L2 into itself, and it maps operator family, like the one we're discussing, into a dual family of the following forms. So you see it's a Fourier right? transform in both variables. It turns discrete to continuous variable into discrete and discrete into continuous. And uh, uh, so the discrete Laplacian is turned into multiplication by two cosine of theta plus an alpha, this quasi-periodic potential, and multiplication by this uh, quasi-periodic potential V is turned into a toplitz operator, it is, uh, uh, where VK are for the coefficients of the function V. And if V, so imagine for a second that V is a trigonometric polynomial, then uh, it, leads, uh, it, it becomes a finite difference operator, 2D plus one difference operator, 2D difference operator, which leads to a symplectic two-dimensional cost cycle, which has Lyapunov exponents. And so what we call dual Lyapunov exponents are the Lyapunov exponents of this symplectic top Lyapunov, positive Lyapunov exponents, non-negative Lyapunov exponents of this symplectic cost cycles. In particular, this gives a spectral inform explanation of the classical Jensen's formula. Okay, so, uh, ah, I still have five minutes. Classical Jensen's formula, because if we look at the operator just without the Laplacian multiplication by a potential like this, then its dual is just a toplitz matrix, and which is a constant symplectic cycles. And it turns out that the dual Lapun of exponents in this case are precisely given by two pi logs of the zeros of this function V. And uh, uh, basically our formula turns precisely into uh, the uh, classical Jensen's formula in this representation. And so uh, uh, 
this uh, so this kind of demystifies Avila's global theory because it tells you precisely what the turning points are. There's a dual level of exponents, and these integers are the multiplicities of the dual level of exponents. It also gives an alternative proof of the global theory. That's actually a different proof. Now, uh, how does it help with the results I previously described? Because, oh, I forgot to say, so uh, you, you can talk about this Lyapunov exponents only if it is a trigonometric polynomial, but it turns out is that if it is an analytic function, then if you look at uh, the corresponding polynomial cutoff, the Lyapunov exponents stabilize if you increase the D. And so you can talk about the limits of these guys, say of the first Lyapunov exponent, when you increase the D, and this is what we call the dual Lyapunov exponent. So in particular, we show that such guys exist. Okay, and um, so how does it uh, help uh, with, uh, as I say, the Stan Martini problem and all? So the key result uh, is that uh, it turns out that if you look at the operators of type one, then in the duals, so, and again, let's assume it's a trigonometric polynomial so that you can talk explicitly about the co-cycles. So it turns out that uh, corresponding transfer matrix co-cycles of those duals are always partially, for type 1 operators, are always partially hyperbolic with two-dimensional centers. So namely, uh, uh, only two Lyapunov exponents are equal to zero and d minus one are positive and d minus one are negative. And then uh, basically a key step in the proof of the Ten Martini problem was uh, that uh, we obtained fake estimates on the uh, uh, on the M functions uh, based on Cotani theory. So Cotani theory that I already mentioned was that if uh, basically, if you have um, absolutely continuous spectrum, so absolutely continuous spectrum is the essential closure of the set where Lyapunov exponent is zero. And uh, a big technical part of it is that, uh, that says that, for example, if you have an interval in the set where Lyapunov exponent is zero, then you can extend certain objects called M functions analytically through this interval. And this is based on uh, Kotani theory. And uh, uh, however, here one would need Kotani theory for the strip. And it has been developed by Kotani and Simon, but only in the case where all Lyapunov exponents are equal to zero. So basically they left it as a problem and it's a paper from 85 or something uh, the, to develop a similar theory if only some Lyapunov exponents are equal to zero. And it turns out that it can be done for minimal dynamical systems. So and uh, so far, it's it has only uh, as a part of this work. We only do it in case of two-dimensional center. It's highly non-trivial. So if you have two uh, zero Lyapunov exponents and all the others are so Lyapunov exponents for symplectic cycles come in uh, opposite sign pairs. So if you have two zero ones, d minus one positive and d minus one negative, and you have actually uniform domination between d minus one and d, then you have the analog of Cotani theory. I'm basically saying it for the experts. So I say 2D, it means uh, when the center is two dimension. Uh, and actually, uh, Lingruyge uh, has work in progress where he develops full Cotani theory 
for arbitrary number of Lyapunov exponents equal to zero. And uh, so this should have uh, very exciting consequences. And then another issue, again, in the proof of the 10 Martini problem, for example, was this Puget's argument about uh, simplicity of the uh, spectrum uh, of uh, uh, simple uh, that uh, used uh, simplicity of the spectrum uh, of second difference operator, and you it used crucial as a fact that for almost uh, dual of the almost match is also a second difference operator, and again for operators with two dimensional center. And we know that all operators of type one have two-dimensional center. And we can extend Puget's argument this way. And finally, I'll finish with another very nice spectral corollary of this uh, dual lepon of exponents. So as I mentioned, um, there has been no, uh, so the, uh, characterization of the spectrum from dynamical systems have been like this, the famous Johnson theorem, that it is the set of energies where either Lyapunov exponent is zero or the transfer matrix co-cycle is non-uniformly hyperbolic. There was no um, determination just from Lyapunov exponents. And what follows from this theory is that for quasi-periodic operators with analytic potential, you can describe the spectrum fully through the Lyapunov exponents and dual Lyapunov exponents. So the spectrum is the set of energies where either the Lyapunov exponent itself or the dual Lyapunov exponent is zero. And so I guess I'll stop at that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, so now it's time for questions. So it's Leonid. Uh, so uh, uh, this notion of acceleration, so does it admit exists in other uh, families of dynamical systems? So like Lyapunov exponents, something which is applicable in many situations. And this I never seen, so. Mm. Well, uh, so uh, basically it's a corollary of convexity, which in turn, in turn is a corollary of analyticity. So basically uh, this uh, should exist for any uh, uh, for Lyapunov exponents of any linear analytic cycle. And, right, uh, the quantization is different. So quantization is the fact that it, it, it is quantized is uh, basically very delicately depends on the theorem. Uh, it, it requires um, so, so the fact that uh, Lyapunov exponent is a, a convex function, okay, so uh, it basically only depends on the fact that uh, uh, it is constant in the imaginary part of epsilon, right? Okay, so this does require quasi-periodicity, I guess. But it would also work in the same way for say operators and cost cycles over the torus rotations. However, already quantization is uh, something absolutely not known for cost cycles of the, over the torus rotations. Basically, th this is all the theory for the rotations of the circle. And um, so and the, it is um, an interesting question what, um, uh, what are the analogs there? And uh, so, no, here, yeah. Uh, more generally, to answer your question, more generally, no, I haven't uh, seen this concept elsewhere. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. Also, Sergei, wanted to ask something? 
<clears throat> or Joel, uh, did you know? So other questions or, or comments? Yes, Vic Victor? Yes, uh, thank you very much for this wonderful talk. Actually, I have a, a question towards uh, its very beginning. I'm. Uh, you've shown the Hofstadter butterfly, and I must confess, I uh, perhaps I should have known, but I forgot uh, this visual uh, self similarity. Is there any formal results for that, or um, so? What seems to be a self similarity? What is actually known on, on it? Okay, so there are physics level results. Uh, in much of it is described in this book that I showed by Satya. Um, so basically, kind of at the physics level of description, there are some interesting description. Uh, there have been recent work by Satya and Wilkinson. At the mass level, very little. So there have been some work by Hans Koch basically describing the renormalization group over here. All right. Mm -hmm. So something like that. So very little actually. So so far it's not really um, so it is clear, original work of, of Tadar already gave some description of how it depends uh, on the continued fraction expansion and all, and uh, some of it, um, there are some interesting <coughs> kind of physics level results, so you can call conjectures, right? But uh, basically it would be, of course, nice to construct a normalization group here, but very, very limited results are available at the moment. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And mm -hmm. sorry, uh, coming back to the other side of your talk, to the dual Lyapunov exponents. Okay. So uh, 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 you're passing by this Fourier transform by this duality, and mm -hmm. Uh, you are saying that uh, for analytic but non-trigonometric potential, you're approximating it by uh, trigonometric polynomials, and you're looking at the top Lapun of exponents. To... No, the, the bottom Lapun of exponents. Uh, the, sorry, the bottom Lapun of exponents. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, and, and they stabilize, they have limits. Mm hmm and uh okay so, and so it for and MRI the uh more complicated is the function the more zeros there are so that's that gives a sequence that goes to an... mm, yeah in principle yes so basically in some sense this neighborhood of the almost major analytic neighborhood of the almost major operators is operators of type one most mm -hmm. likely these are actually cosine type functions functions that have uh, we do not define them this way but that's what is kind of mm -hmm. right so the more wiggling the function has uh, is there uh, mm -hmm. Complicated structure of zero, there will be. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, other questions or comments? So, I have a naive question. So, these Cantor sets that appear as a spectrum. Uh, mm -hmm. Can they be fat Cantor set? Uh, I mean, with positive measure, or oh, it's yeah, 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 right. Okay. So, the, for say for the almost major operator, the measure of the spectrum is actually precisely known. This is one of the uh -huh. uh, Simon's problem. I just didn't mention that as uh -huh. the measure of the spectrum is equal to uh, okay to uh, four minus uh, four minus 
for lambda or something like that. So basically it's equal to zero only at the critical point, only if lambda is equal to one. Mm. Uh, and otherwise it's it's definitely a fat country set. Yeah. Lots of other facts are known. I am not uh, nearly given the full review or the full history here. Okay, so other questions or comments? No, so maybe if not, uh, we can thank Lana again for this excellent talk. Thank you, Lana. Thank you very much for having me. Great audience. And the thing are done, right? Uh, Joel, do you want to say something else? Or... <laughs> well, thank you everyone for coming and uh, thank you to the scientific committee for organizing this. Yes. See you at the next uh, lecture.